So thanks for having me. I'm gonna present a, a quick case this morning. And my dogs are just getting up, so I apologize. I'm clearly a fan of the, the Boston sports teams. Um, but this is a 79 year old male who was actually admitted to an outside hospital with uh, fluid overload essentially with uh, pulmonary edema who had a history of an aortic and mitral valve replacement uh, who was noted to have an aortic valve leak uh, and was being evaluated for a TAVR when during hemodialysis, he acutely developed visual loss in his left eye. It sounds like at that time, he was kind of waxing and waning a bit and the history was a bit unclear. Um, they had consulted kind of teleneurology and it was the plan actually at that time because it was in this acute window and there was concern uh, for his visual loss. Uh, that he was going to be airlifted actually to Duke for a, a rapid eye stroke code essentially uh, because he was going to be within the window for potential intervention and we'll get to that. Uh, unfortunately for this gentleman uh, he was essentially there was traffic on the helipad so he was just hovering above the hospital and missed that window actually he showed up about four and a half hours or was wheeled in about four and a half hours into the his symptoms. Um, which caused some delays. Uh, as, as I said, he had that history of the kind of the, the valve replacements and reported carotid stenosis. On his exam, he's chronically hypotensive. He was actually on midodrine and Florinef. So he was, his systolics were in the eighties at times in the upper seventies. He was on six liters of nasal cannula, cannula with his fluid overload. Uh, he had only kind of light perception in his left eye. And then when you looked in his left eye, he had already been dilated. Uh, what you had noticed, it wasn't as kind of pretty as this, but he certainly had this, you can see my mouse, there's this retinal kind of whitening there, and then there's this cherry red spot that you would have noted. Uh, the right eye was normal. Uh, the rest of his exam was rather unremarkable at the time. Uh, he had a CT of his head that was negative or showed no acute abnormalities, and then a CTA of his head and neck at the same time that showed no hemodynamically significant carotid stenosis, uh, did have some calcified plaque, but otherwise uh, nothing severe. So essentially what this gentleman had based on his exam was a central retinal artery occlusion, otherwise known as an eye stroke. Um, this is an ischemic stroke of the retina causing sudden onset painless vision loss. Um, you can see kind of the anatomy here. So the, the central retinal artery actually comes off the ophthalmic, which is a branch of the ICA. And it takes this sharp bend off of that artery to supply the retina itself. Um, so when you get an occlusion there, essentially you're, you're creating ir irreversible or creating retinal ischemia that causes this sudden vision loss. And why you get this, that causes kind of that whitening of the retina itself and then that cherry red spot itself is because these choroidal arteries that kind of also provide some blood flow are still perfusing, uh, which creates that kind of color. If you were to obstruct the ophthalmic, you wouldn't really have that. You might get just kind of diffuse whitening itself. 95% um, of these cases are non-arteritic and it's a, a rare cause of stroke, meaning non-arteritic, meaning more embolic kind of ischemic. Uh, phenomenon and 5% are arteritic themselves like an inflammatory process like a GCA or a vasculitis. Most commonly in older adults, these are uh, secondary to ipsilateral carotid uh, atherosclerosis. Um, we commonly think about these with amaurosis. It's a common presentation of a symptomatic carotid. Oftentimes in younger folks, they can be cardioembolic or secondary to local disease as well, like local small vessel atheromas. Um, you have to think about GCA with some of these folks, especially in older folks. More rare causes are like Susak syndrome, which causes branch retinal artery occlusions, also sensory neural hearing loss and encephalopathy. And then these various kinds of vasculitides can cause this type of presentation. About 15 to 30% of the population actually has a, a variant um, called the ciliaretinal artery, which comes off the posterior ciliary circulation, which can actually provide some perfusion to the retina. So those folks will actually have some visual sparing when they get this phenomenon, um, which can help them in terms of their overall visual recovery and uh, prognosis. 
typical workup, this is an ophthalmologic emergency and it's a stroke. Um, so you're going to do a, a, a stroke workup essentially to look for an etiology. So importantly, based on just the risk factors themselves, vascular imaging uh, with a CTA or an MRA, whatever you can do uh, to look at the carotids themselves and the intracranial vasculature will help. An MRI uh, can help assess if there's any further um, areas of like embolic disease that gives you a clue in terms of the etiology uh, itself, echocardiography to, to think about cardioembolic sources, you know, thrombuses, valvular disease, like in this gentleman's case, uh, inflammatory markers and thinking about uh, GCA, your typical risk factor labs, like a A1C and a lipid panel. Uh, in the right population, just like in your other kinds of stroke, you might consider further workup with prothrombotic conditions, malignancies, inflammatory causes. Um, otherwise, you know, in more subtle cases, uh, and especially in branch retinal cases, you might think about fluorescein angiography. This is typically takes quite a long time and isn't as useful in the acute setting. Um, but I know we had a case on general where you could have thought about this, um, where there was some kind of uh, waxing and waning of this visual loss that then came back. You could think about um, fluorescein angiography at that point, or OCTs, essentially to look at the retinal layers themselves, um, which is kind of a non-invasive test where acutely you can see, you know, increased edema or some increased like. Uh, like hyper, I think it's hyperreflexivity of the, the retina itself to look for ischemia. This is actually a picture of a, uh, a patient who has that ciliaretinal artery, the variant, and has sparing of that territory. So you can see they have still some of that central vision. In terms of acute treatment, um, there's been studies, and Dr. McGrory was heavily involved in this, and we're very lucky to have him, that showed within four and a half hours of uh, onset, uh, IVTPA actually created huge differences in outcomes. So about 42% of patients uh, improved to a visual loss of 2100, which is quite significant if you consider some of these people only have light perception or can't see anything at all versus kind of the natural history itself. Um, and about 30% of these patients improved to 2060, which is a huge lifestyle benefit if you go from not being able to see to just having some impairments in your vision in terms of what you'll be able to do long-term. Uh, importantly, in terms of education and other things we're still learning about, a 2018 survey showed only about 53% of providers are even uh, considering or treating with TPA in this setting. And, and now we know there's a huge benefit. So it's important to, to get to these people quickly uh, because often they don't present to the hospital more acutely. They might go to an optometrist or wait and see, and, uh, see someone in clinic days later uh, and then end up in the hospital for their workup where some of our options are limited. More conservatively, uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatments, and we're lucky to have this at Duke, uh, has been shown to have improvements in about 60% of cases. Uh, what you're really doing is you're providing an increased partial pressure of oxygen and you're trying to reperfuse the retina itself through the, the choroidal system, which provides about 50% of blood flow to the retina itself. Uh, but increases to upwards of the upper 90% with a higher partial pressure. So you're trying to get some uh, collateral circulation there to preserve some vision. Um, and this helps quite often on, on a lot of our patients, which is uh, nice to see. Unfortunately, sometimes when you're, you're late to it, um, some of these people don't have any improvement at all. Interestingly enough, um, Previously, even when I was in medical school, I used to hear about things like ocular massage or you know, anterior chamber paracentesis or these other kind of external uh, modulation type techniques to change the intraocular pressure to hopefully propagate the clot itself. Um, there's some evidence that this actually led to worse outcomes as compared to just the natural history of disease. In terms of secondary prevention, just like in, in our ischemic stroke cases, antithrombotics, uh, obviously if they have AFib, you're gonna think about anticoagulation. Um, interestingly enough, uh, right there in the guidelines written even by Dr. McGrory himself, um, you can see that oftentimes these patients may just have this as their acute presentation. And then typically in, in uh, stroke patients with an NI stroke scale of less than or equal to three will often consider dual antiplatelet. And you can do that here. And a lot of providers will do that. But 
um, it's still something being discussed, but it is there in the, the guidelines uh, themselves. If they have a severe ipsilateral stenosis, and that's thought to be the etiology, carotid revascularization, as seen on the right, uh, with an example of a CEA will be important in, in creating a large scale risk reduction in these patients uh, for further episodes. You're going to do a serum workup for risk factors and other risk factor management. I always think it's important to mention obstructive sleep apnea as a, as a risk factor for uh, stroke. And I think we've done, you know, in learning about that from people like Dr. Spector, it's very helpful in a lot of these patients in managing their comorbid disease. Uh, cardiac monitoring. Uh, in the hospital with telemetry. And then if you're thinking about the, you know, paroxysmal AFib, things like that, sending people out on some kind of loop recorder and then other behavioral interventions like diet, thinking about a Mediterranean diet or smoking cessation, uh, weight loss, exercise, uh, et cetera. Um, in conclusion, this guy actually, uh, unfortunately did not uh, have any improvement in his vision uh, itself, the etiology was thought to be cardioembolic from his valvular disease. So he had positive transcranial Dopplers looking for uh, emboli monitoring. And the, the first day, the next day, he had no positive hits uh, itself. He had a significant history of cardiac disease um, without kind of a severe ipsilateral carotid stenosis. Um, unfortunately, he was lost to follow up and never followed up in the eye stroke clinic itself, though it was uh, set up. So this is the second patient in a row I've done that we have no idea what happened long term. In terms of future directions, there's some evidence that, you know, in about 90 to 105 minutes, there's some irreversible damage to the retina itself. So looking at more hyper acute um, outcomes with treatments like TPA will be important to better understand just for us, as well as the population at large, the type of emergency this is, because it is an acute emergency. These people can end up with, you know, loss of vision itself can be kind of a devastating thing that we don't always consider. Um, and it's important for these people, people to show up to the hospital acutely, though, you know, sometimes it may just be dry eye or something like that, but an evaluation can be quite helpful. Um, I still think there's a, a question and I was talking to Dr. Fang about this as well, about other external techniques. So the, the central retinal artery itself is a very, very, very small artery. It's not like you're going to be able to snake a, you know, a catheter in there and do a thrombectomy on these types of patients. So are there ways we can still externally manipulate or do other type, types of interventions um, to either try to clear these you know, whether it's an embolus or a thrombus or an atheroma to try to clear them to spare some uh, vision. Things like learning more about the process of visual rehabilitation and different uh, methods we can do to help these people in terms of their functional status is also quite important and it'll be something to follow long term. Um, and then just education at large. It's, as I said, this is an emergency. Um, All right. Thank you so very much, Dylan. We appreciate that. So uh, we'll turn it over to Andrew to introduce our grand round speaker. Sounds good. I'll get off. If I can stop sharing. Thanks. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're kicking off our 2021-22 uh, diversity and inclusion grand round series. Uh, we've got three scheduled lectures this year. This is number one. Starting us off is going to be Dr. Dane Wicker. Dr. Wicker joined Duke in 2016 after completing his undergraduate degree at Hendricks College in Arkansas and a master's degree and PhD at Marquette University. For the sports fans, Hendricks College, they are the Warriors and their colors are orange and brown. I looked that up. So uh, here at Duke, Dr. Wicker is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He specializes in dialectical behavioral therapy and conducting pre-surgical and behavioral health assessments for transgender individuals seeking medical transition within an interdisciplinary team. Here at Duke, he's also the director of LGBTQ initiatives for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and serves as the faculty advisor for Duke Med Pride. He is also the co-director somehow in all of the free time you must have. Uh, of the Equity and Research Corps at the Duke Clinical and Translational Science Institute, a very experienced teacher who's given over 85 trainings and workshops on LGBTQ healthcare, uh, both inside and outside Duke. So we're very lucky to have him. Uh, he's going to give us his 86th talk today, and he's titled it, 
creating an affirming environment for our LGBTQ patients and colleagues. So, Dr. Wicker, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for the warm welcome, Andrew. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and go from there. Can everyone see that? Is that coming up okay? Oh. Yep. Yeah, that's perfect. Yep. Excellent. All right. So I will go ahead and get started. Um, just I'm, I'm, I will note things throughout this presentation. Um, so thinking about what you can do in your everyday practices to make your environment more affirming both for patients and colleagues, thinking about putting pronouns on your presentations um, here. We also have uh, Duke Pride branding, um, which I'll probably talk a little bit later, but all, all of those little signals uh, matter. And so today, briefly, why is this an important topic to discuss? Uh, what makes a clinical environment affirming for our LGBTQ patients? Uh, how can we use EPIC to improve care? How can we create an affirming environment for our LGBT colleagues and potentially future colleagues? Uh, this is becoming increasingly important as we're thinking about recruitment. And what are some of the up and coming LGBTQ initiatives for Duke Health? Um, I will preface this by saying that I have included some direct quotes from, um, they're de-identified of course, but from actual Duke patients and so, uh, just to illustrate that this is an on, uh, ongoing topic for consideration. So why is this important for us to discuss? You may have not seen this earlier this year, but we actually increased the number by about a percent um, to 5.6 of US adults identifying as LGBTQ. What's interesting is that there are significant cohort effects here uh, so this is the sort of graph, you can see this upward trend uh, from Gallup. But then when you look at the cohort differences, who is driving this? It is our um, Generation Z, so people born from 1997 to 2002, who have uh, 15, almost 16% identify as LGBTQ. So more and more as these young adults are coming to medical school, coming into uh, residencies and fellowships, um, and then presenting at our clinics, uh, are, they are going to have LGBTQ identities. And then just this is another graph that I think can show you some of the different trajectories that we have. Um, and this one looks at millennials and was from um, three years ago with 8.2, so millennials far above even the next generation X. And then at the very bottom, uh, we have like the traditionalists uh, as well as the baby boomers. So there is nuance by generation. So depending on work, if you work with um, pediatrics or uh, geriatrics, you may have very different experiences here. Um, also, as far as several milestones, we have differences by age. And you can see the things that you would think would hang together do. Uh, so, you know, when people actually experience that uh, attraction, it's about the same age across cohorts. Um, but you start to see these bigger and bigger gaps um, when people are actually having sex with the same sex partner, identifying as LGB, um, and we're, this solely looked at lesbian, gay, and bisexual um, individuals, not uh, trans. Um, and then coming out is where we see the, the widest difference among people. So thinking about neurology and LGBTQ health, which I think mostly we don't, is the reality. Um, and that was kind of when I did a quick literature review, um, some, of, some of the messaging um, from the articles in neurology were saying, this is 
something that we don't think about a lot. And, and usually we do work um, more with endocrine, plastic surgery, urology, et cetera. Um, but just some, some notes that I gleaned from my initial lit review here were that you all report a high awareness of the disparities and the outcomes with LGBTQ people. Um, but there is this kind of little awareness of the role of specific neurological care. Um, and so a few of those are um, PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis um, and Truvada is related to neuropathy. We've seen a huge increase in uptake of demand for um, PrEP and Truvada. And so this may be something that we will particularly see among our SGM or sexual gender minority um, men. Um, and then we have an elderly cohort of LGBTQ individuals um, who are going into long-term care facilities who often um, have a deceased partner and um, can face a new wave of discrimination when they go into these facilities, uh, often alone, often without family. And um, they go back into the closet out of fear of being treated poorly. And so this is a place where I think neurologists can really advocate for their patients and it will become increasingly important. Uh, also, uh, I don't know if you all know AIM Simmons, but helped create the HEI index that our hospitals use, is also in the process of creating a similar version for long-term care facilities um, now that they'll be rated on. Also see a disproportionately higher tobacco use because of you know, cultural determinants and disparities that can increase the likelihood of stroke. Um, and then as far as when we're thinking about transgender individuals, um, I have a reference list at the end, but there are a number of very new kind of things that they're thinking about related to um, gender affirming hormone therapy that could have neurological impacts. And I am not by any means saying like this, uh, to not do the gender affirming hormone therapies, those are very life-saving, but really thinking about um, investigating these further, I think will be really important. So there is a relationship with uh, our health and LGBTQ in neurology. So what makes a clinical environment affirming for LGBTQ individuals? Um, and I will read a message, so using a patient's correct name and pronouns. And this is a message from an, an actual Duke uh, patient. Um, I love being a woman, my dream come true, but it's turned into a continuing nightmare, misgendering. Duke is the worst offender. Yes, I'm impressed with the work and I'm encouraged with the enthusiasm you and others show for transgender individuals like myself. But excuse my bluntness, what good is it all if the people we have to deal with at Duke misgender us. Say I spent an hour at Duke Circle undergoing various procedures. The staff there misgendered me eight times. I wore leggings, my nails are polished bright red, I have long hair cut in a bob, but the Duke staff misgendered me eight times. One of the staff receptionists in one department kept telling people to have a blessed day. My bone marrow turned to ice. So this was from a patient in May of this year. I will say on average, I probably receive um, about two a week um, of these kind of reports. And so it is an ongoing problem at Duke. Um, and really here is thinking about um, using pronouns that are listed um, and patient's pronouns, paying attention to the honorifics, you know, being referred to ma'am, uh, when that's how someone wants to be called is so important. And so then next, so I'll go into EPIC and there's definitely some room for growth here, but we can also uh, use it to create um, affirming collaborative clinical experiences for our patients. And this can happen at multiple times. So ideally what we know about SGM populations is that uh, they like to give information about sexual orientation and gender identity 
uh, prior to. So we do have a sex, all, all of us, if we're Duke patients and have a my chart, have a sex and gender form. I believe it's in other questionnaires. It's pretty well hidden. Um, so you can actually fill that out yourself ahead of time. And so that's something that's, that's I would say, the ideal. Um, the second time that you may be collecting sexual orientation, gender identity, what we call SOGI data, is that either at intake. So you want your staff to be trained in inclusive language practices. You want to have standardize those questions. Um, and then make sure that they are recorded in the electronic medical record. Uh, finally, this could end up in while well, you're in the room where you're talking about it, in which case, and that's so we do have research that that is less pref preferable for our LGBTQ patients um, than uh, putting it in electronically. So I know that there's some pilots going on with iPads and clinic waiting rooms, et cetera. And this is from HRSA. And so this is what our Duke My Chart sex and gender form looks like from the patient perspective. Um, so what is your current identity? You have these options you can click. What is your sex assigned at birth? Um, I think that one thing that we need to acknowledge is that I believe 10 states and DC at this point do have intersex as a legal gender marker. Um, so that is an area for improvement. And then what is your sexual orientation? You can see we have increasingly pansexual is common, especially among transgender individuals, because if you think about uh, pansexual as someone who is attracted to all genders, including transgender people, but it also doesn't require you to identify your own, uh, your own sexual orientation, unlike using something like lesbian or gay, which implies I am a man who's attracted to other men, or I'm a woman who's attracted to other women. So when you're in my chart, this is kind of what you see. And I don't know how many of you have done this, but are, are in Epic. Um, if you click on female, this is what will give you access to the clinician version of that form. And so this is what it looks like. Um, and so for this person, we have all of these options. So if someone fills this out ahead of time, these areas up here will already be filled out. However, we fill out kind of from here down. So is there the presentation, which is, are they, how do people dress? Is it aligned with their gender identity? Is their preferred name aligned with their gender identity? Is their legal name aligned with their gender identity? And then we also look for uh, legal sex, gender marker, and then medical surgical intervention. So this is something that I would typically write, patient is seeking double incision mastectomy with free nipple grafts, previous gender affirming procedures include bilateral full pingo oophorectomy and hormone replacement therapy using transdermal testosterone and progesterone. Um, so you kind of give a brief summary of what's already happened and then what will happen is the plan. And we're increasingly trying to move towards using or an organ inventory. Um, and so you can see here that this person, and it's a little bit confusing because you can see that the patient sex assigned at birth was female. Um, and so what we would expect to develop, and I wish they had done, you know, the, the other way around green and red. Um, but right now this, patient, you can see, does not have a cervix, does not have ovaries, does not have uterus, does not have vagina, um, and but has yet to have a mastectomy. So that is what they're seeking now. If you are looking to change the name, you click on the actual, whether they may have a photo, they may not, or it could be the, um, the patient's initials. And once you're there, this little, and sign, we'll pull up the name edit. Um, and then you can write in preferred name, Michael. Um, and so I will say this has changed in, in the direction that we're still working to um, reverse, um, but 
I guess I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to that. But also if you hover over the gender, it will give you a brief summary. So some people may use pronouns like they, them, theirs, and he, him, his, and they're comfortable with either. Uh, best practice I would say is to switch. Um, and so they identify as non-binary and um, you can see the, the brief organ inventory here. Um, so this is what I was talking about with the name edit. So when you put in the, the name here, what, um, I'm trying to think exactly when it switched. It was shortly before COVID. Um, we used to be able to see this go as right here where, where Vincent would be. And then underneath would say legal name. I don't know if you all remember that, but in much smaller letters. After this changed, we had so many more incidents of misgendering and dead naming, um, which is what we call when someone uses the name to sign a birth that will tell them uh, and indicate a uh, gender. So this is something to consider, um, but be on the lookout and use, use the name in quotation marks if you're looking in the chart. All right. So how can this be how can this be a helpful thing it helps ensure that the patient is getting optimal care um, we want to make sure that this is updated because if an individual is listed as um, you know sometimes we use male or female and then we have this downstream idea of what care they need but if someone no longer has uh, you know, a cervix, they're not going to need a pap smear anymore. Um, or, you know, if people who identify as women uh, or trans women, and they still have a prostate, that's not part of gender affirmation surgery, they don't remove the prostate, they still need prostate screening. So if we have them listed as women and we don't have that flag, so that's why the organ inventory is so important. Um, it can really, um, lead to some problems with medical error there that we don't want. It helps with their poor. Sometimes, especially if patients are transitioning or trans patients are transitioning, or if you have someone who identifies as gender fluid, which means their experience of gender can change over time. If you work with teenagers, this might come up um, more, more often, um, but also happens with adults. So just checking with them to make sure that you are using the name and pronouns that they want can make a huge difference. Um, the more holistic care, and it shows the patients that you are non judgmental, you want to treat them with respect, you're interested in their overall health and well being. So, all good things. Um, more, pract more practical tips here um, for allies. So, one of the things that has come up. Um, and this is another patient, uh, this is a more recent quote that we've uh, received is, uh, we have a lack of out providers at Duke. Um, we may have a lack of LGBTQ providers, um, but I tend to think that people can feel because I learn more and more about people who are that I had no idea. Um, and so, this was, I reviewed the profiles of over 100 gynecologists on the Find a Dr. Duke Health page. None of the profiles or videos I viewed spoke of the queer community or such expertise leaving me frustrated. I went to the Durham LGBTQ Center website and no Duke gynecologists are listed and very few physicians from Duke. And so this was just a few days ago um, that we got this feedback. So I, um, we are going to be relaunching the outlist, but there are also other opportunities that the health system is coming up with um, for providers to be able to um, really um, kind of show that this is something that's important. So you may have gotten the emails about non-binary being an option. Um, so if you do not identify as male or female, you can change that. And there is now a non-binary option um, on uh, DukeHealth.org um, and finding, uh, finding your provider. 
And then these are a little bit more practical. Uh, so we did this, it took, it took quite a bit to get this done, but we did uh, create a, an official Duke logo with our licensing, trademarking and branding office. So all of these are, have been pre-approved. So as long as you don't make any special changes, um, I think other than having your department on there is fine, but the, um, they are automatically approved. You do not have to go through the long rigmarole that it usually does. Um, water bottles, um, pronoun buttons are great to wear. They tell people both that you are knowledgeable about this um, and that, you know, it. It's basically just the thing. And the people who um, are straight and cisgender, I mean, their, their gender matches what they were assigned, the gender they were assigned at birth, they don't, it doesn't seem to really notice them. And so, and Vanderbilt actually did research on this and 78% of physicians thought that they would get blowback for asking about questions. Um, when in fact the number was 10%. So considering so, you know, Southern Academic Medical Center, I think we could make some um, jumps there. But yeah, consider what are you wearing? Like, how are you signaling safety? Um, in telehealth visits, consider putting your pronouns there. Do not make assumptions. Um, so I, um, I had a primary care physician for quite a while. Um, who would, who would always ask me, um, you know, how is your wife? And I would say, Jeff's great, playing a lot of tennis at the faculty club. <laughs> and so that, um, it, it's just kind of something that we need to work on, but just trying not to make those assumptions. And uh, then we get into non-binary. This is a bigger can of worms because a lot of, we have a lot of this built into our SMART phrases, um, sometimes in our ABS summaries, uh, dear sir, madam, to patient letters. It's all binary. There's no room for people who do not conform the, to those. And, on, and often it's uh, linked, uh, the data is linked to someone's uh, either legal sex or sex assigned at birth rather than their gender identity. So then they're getting misgendered through their communications, through their after visit summaries, when they look at your notes um, and all of those things add up. And uh, so this is another, another instance uh, from a patient at Duke um, where on their problem list, the provider had written in transgender. And so, we're already taking care of these things. That's kind of my job in a lot of ways. Um, is to, um, but looking at thinking about the problem list, not pathologizing someone's innate identity um, or suggesting that it needs um, to necessarily be treated or fixed. Um, but it's the main message here. Um, know how to help. No, in your, when you're in your clinic, know of any single stall family restrooms. Um, I usually say we have a gender, gender neutral restroom here. The men's woman, or men's room is here, women's room's here. Um, you're welcome to use whatever you'd like. The 21 seat hotel in Durham, they, they put these up right after HB2 came out. Um, and if there is no gender neutral restroom, which there's actually a map showing the health system and the university and where we have um, what we'd consider gender inclusive restrooms or single stall. Um, and it, it is jarring to look at the difference between that divide. Um, so there's some work to be done. So what if I mess up, say the wrong thing? Um, I love this quote, the chief trick to making good mistakes is not to hide them, especially not from yourself. So really, um, yeah, don't, don't turn away from it. Just use it as a room to grow and hopefully it will get better. Uh, I did take a look at your, your website. So I wanted to give you some feedback on this. You all are an exemplar um, program. So really keep up the good work. Um, I love that you have diversity in your 
um, I believe this mission vision um, values here. And um, right on the front page having this, um, I think read more about our efforts, signals transparency, builds trust, and Dr. Spector is always, I think, an effective recruitment strategy. Um, so uh, also, I also noticed this specifically, you already have sexual orientations and gender identities listed in your our culture part of your web page. That is exactly what you want to, you know, what people will be looking for, the safety signals, and I will be welcome within your department. Um, so as you're recruiting, you know, make sure that you highlight this website to them because I think it will really um, point to where you are. And there are also some other signals that I saw here with even within your strategic plan. So you said themselves with female pronouns. Um, so you're not, you're, instead of saying women, you said people with female who are using female pronouns, you're not making assumptions. So really fantastic work. Um, you could consider adding, adding a couple things. Um, you could talk about intersectionality, and then I think this is something that everybody um, would benefit from, but really posting your non-discrimination, um, especially when people, there's a lot of fear from, we found from people coming from the North to the South. And so having this here and knowing that there's institutional protection um, and that's covered is really, um, can be important. And so I'm going to skip ahead. I'm realizing the time. Um, but things to be mindful of when you're working with your colleagues. Um, sometimes there's a lack of awareness of the policy, uh, vicarious discriminations of hearing jokes. You may not know if someone is LGBTQ. Uh, a lot of times you may not, looking at kind of the people who stay in the closet in the medical realm. Um, there can be a strong fear of retaliation, which is what keeps people um, in the closet and negatively impacts their performance, keeps their some kind of a way. Uh, residents and our trainees are vulnerable. So we really do need more LGBTQ visibility assessment and leadership across the health system. And I think I'm almost done. Reporting processes and coming out at Duke, um, these are all things you can contact me if someone does um, transition at Duke. That's a pretty complicated procedure and one that could HR should be able to help you with and I can also consult on. Um, and then exciting developments. So these are things under consideration. Um, having a box where people could check open the LGBTQ to find a provider. Um, being able to mark um, like as a signal openly LGBTQ either on the front page of your um, and what we're actually going to, to be doing first is LGBTQ or LGBTQ ally. Um, so it will, um, I think that's what we'll be rolling out first or in your about me section. And then again, the non-binary piece. So we're also out relaunching the Duke Health Outlist. So you will be hearing more about that. It's already been um, launched. So I can send you the link to that. Um, we'll also have the Duke Center for Gender Health and Wellness, which is continuing to be supported, which I'm so happy about and will be coming soon. Um, so thank you all. Um, your work is very near and dear to me, especially with my dog has uh, syringomyelia and PRI malformation and had a crania, uh, crania, I can mean cranioplasty done some years ago. So I'm grateful for the work that you do, sincerely. Uh, thank, thank you, Dave. You and, uh, yeah, and thanks for your compliment of, of Andrew and the work he does. I mean, we're all incredibly proud of him. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, Dane, thank you very much. And um, I really appreciate you giving us this talk. Rich, is it all right if I ask a, a question? Fire away. Okay, so we have you, you mentioned the issue with um, misgendering, and you, you gave that quote eight times. And one of the areas I think people find most challenging is 
when you don't have Maestro open to tell you pronouns right there in the corner. You're in a hallway, you know, this is the South. A lot of people default to yes, sir, or like, yes, ma'am, just comes out of their mouth. So without prior information from Maestro, what's the recommended strategy here to avoid gendered terms? What do we use? You know, excuse me, fill in the blank, where we normally would say, sir or ma'am, what would you recommend to get someone's attention? You don't know them, you don't have a chart. Right, and so, and well, the nice thing about like the direct patient interaction is usually it, it can be you and you don't have to use those terms. But when it is someone in the hallway or when you're talking with um, a nurse or something like that, um, you know, I, I would say using the name is the best thing to do that is that you may or may not know or, or, or the last name. Um, and then as soon as you can, I would ask the patients, what pronouns do you go by or what pronouns do you use? And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, everyone from the parking attendants to the, the, the staff at the info desks who are never going to know the names and never going to know, you know, but they're trying to be polite. What do we teach them and what do we share across the health system? Because those eight misgendered times probably aren't necessarily all providers. There are probably other no. people they're interacting right. with who, who won't have ever have that level of familiarity. Right. And so, and I will say DUHSO, Bill Fulkerson and um, Rhonda Brandon did through OIE did implement um, like a LMS training that everyone had to complete. I don't, I don't know. So if you, but the PDC, it's, unfortunately PDC members, uh, school of nursing and school of medicine employees were all exempted. Um, this can be more difficult. Um, and I, you know, I think that it, it, it really is taking a big system push to get education to all of these different corners because we need to get there. We can't have this happening. It's been linked to, um, you know, people won't come back for care. It increases uh, substance abuse. It increases suicidality they've directly linked this now with health system experiences. So um, it, it is a priority. I don't know that I have the best answer for you um, because right. it is so ingrained and it's a sign of respect. So people are trying to be respectful um, and it may come out wrong. Uh, so Dan, I, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Go, go, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, there was a question from Kim Johnson, Kim. Yeah, Dane, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, just wanted to um, ask a question specifically with our patients who have dementia. I encounter this in the clinic a lot where I have uh, people come in, a patient, and they have a caregiver who's a same-sex partner, and they don't, they don't feel free to talk about their relationship. And I think this might be because of, you know, what you talked about with the older geriatric population and some issues they have with long-term care. But I wanted to know how to just uh, let them know that there's space that they can speak freely about the relationship. And how do you recommend doing that? And I, I think it is great. I didn't know about that tab where I could look and see if they've identified their relationship on that. So I think that might be um, a great way, but just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Oh, absolutely. And I think this is where our, like, our nonverbal communication can be, both our verbal and our nonverbal communication uh, can be really helpful um, in uh, any of those safety signals are going to be recognized and likely to make someone more, you know, so a pen, uh, a lanyard, anything like that um, can help make someone using your pronouns on your, on Zoom can make um, someone more likely to make that disclosure. But I think in asking, you know, so who is, um, who is part of your caregiving team or, or who is part of your, um, I'm sorry, not caregiving team, but who is part of, who, who lives in the house with you? Um, do you have a partner using non-gendered language? Um, who is your spouse? Um, and um, 
asking about that. Uh, sometimes, you know, our older patients have actually had traumatic experiences where they've been chased by military. I've had worked with vets who've been literally chased by the military into gay bars and um, who have are, are very scared of disclosing this information um, and justifiably so. Uh, but I think that asking frankly, people expect physicians to ask them about sex and sexuality in a frank manner. Um, and I think you can just ask and, and they will be willing to tell you. Um, also having things in your clinic that do show that you are, this is a, um, an affirming place to be is just vital. People are taking in the nonverbal cues all the time when they're weighing out the risk of disclosure. So also what you mentioned also, Dane, the, um, that PrEP and the risk for, for sexual and gender minority men. And so I was just gonna throw out the reason men get PrEP is because women were excluded from the trials, right? right. So they didn't study the role of PrEP to prevent HIV in women. So because they weren't included in the trials, the FDA didn't approve them. So this is a big uh, gap in healthcare uh, because women were not eligible for the trials. So in case anyone's thinking about study design, uh, the argument they gave is that they thought it would be too hard to recruit them. So that's why you see men on PrEP and not women on PrEP. And I'm so glad that you brought that up, Andrew. And it's, it speaks to another, um, we actually have some, like with Mary McKellar and our CFAR, um, there are some individuals that are doing some great research um, and um, the beauty shops and actually having asked me about prep and training um, like hairstylists essentially to have conversations about prep with their patients or not with their patients, with, with their clients while they're doing their hair. Um, and so they're really creative interventions are going on to try and address that issue because it is very much actually white gay men who are getting prep access. But yeah, that's such a great point. Well, Dane, thank you for uh, doing grand rounds. And Andrew, thank you for organizing it. And everyone else, and you both have a safe day. Thank you. And please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions afterward. And I'll pass on the slides to Andrew afterwards. Excellent. Can we um, post on Twitter as well? Sure. Excellent. Thank you, Dane. Thank you.